going to count down. I'll hit. Hello, folks, and welcome to the Great Scott's Roundtable. I am the Great Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, for any of you who have ever seen my roundtables in the past, you know that the way I started them during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic was to have a group of actors get together and basically, for lack of a better term, talk shop about their craft. And I did this for a while before moving into reunions and other subjects as well. Well, you've also probably noticed that if you are one of my subscribers, that these roundtables have been few and far between uh, more lately. And there's a reason for that. I ran out of ideas. It happens. What can I say? So what do you do when you run out of ideas? You decide to go back to basics. And that's what we're doing here today. We are doing the first actors roundtable that we have done in a while. And I've gotten together three very, very talented and experienced actors who have actually all never met each other. And I'm just thrilled to have them here. And I hope that you will enjoy us as we talk over the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour. And without further ado, let me introduce you to our guests. First up, we have a gentleman who has not only who not only appeared on my first roundtable, but he went on to be my most frequent guest, having appeared in eight of my roundtables, whether they be actors or reunion ones. Uh, we first met on the set of my screenwriting debut, The Reconciler, and we went on to share the screen in a short film called Lucifer and the Father, which we are at the moment trying to get a follow up made to. He has 100 IMDb credits to his name, including the lead role in a film called Past Shadows, which he also produced. He played a pivotal role in the Steven Spielberg movie Lincoln, which we will talk a little bit about, I'm sure. And if anybody out there looks at this guy and says, why do I know him? He looks kind of familiar. Well, that might be because a lot of people know him as the hearing aid guy, having, given the fact that he starred in a series of commercials for hearing assist. Uh, say hello to my a man I'm glad to call my friend, Mr. Robert Shepard, who I'm allowed to call Bob. How are you, sir? What? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. I'm fine. Hey, Scott, it's really good to see you. And I'm so excited about our other guests today. Yes, yeah, so am I. Now, before we get uh, to those guests, one thing that we need to do here is sometimes, you know, YouTube channels have sponsors. I do not have a sponsor, but we do. You and I do have a very, very, very quick commercial. We'd like to encourage anybody out there to see the film that he and I starred in, Lucifer and the Father. He played God. I played the devil. And uh, we are in the process of trying to get a follow-up to that made called Lucifer and the Father, Joseph and the Doctor, that we hope will serve as a jumping point to help us make a mini-series. And we have a Facebook page, right, Bob? Yes, we do. Yes, and you actually qu comment on that quite a bit. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that. And uh, we have a GoFundMe set up as well, which will be in the um, summary for this video. So please check out our short film, Lucifer and the Father. And if you feel led to contribute a little bit to the GoFundMe, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, commercial over, time to move on to the next guests. Oh, one other thing that I should mention is one of the reasons why I have my dear friend Bob here is not just so we could briefly promote Lucifer and the Father, not just because he's a great actor and he's been on my round table more than anybody, but because sometimes you just need a friend when you're in certain situations. And this is a situation where I needed a friend because Bob is here to make sure that I don't go from commentator and host to full blown fanboy mode with these other two guys, because these are guys whose work I've admired for a long time. And I'm just thrilled to death that they are both here on my round table today. So without further ado, let's get to our next guest. Our next guest is an accomplished actor, musician, producer, and director with over a hundred credits to his name. He and his wife uh, made a documentary called Showing Up, which I'm sure that we will talk a little bit about. His film credits include Catch Me If You Can, Captain Marvel, and The One with Jet Li. He has done guest spots on more popular TV shows than I can even count. He has uh, appeared on a lot of my favorite shows, including Castle, Walker, Texas Ranger, Revenge, Quantum Leap, and The Mentalist, just to name a few. But if anybody, but the role he is probably best known for is a role on a show from Fox called 24. Anybody who knew me in the early 2000s knows that I was a big fan of the show 24, where Kiefer Sutherland played special uh, CTU agent Jack Bauer, always trying to um, prevent some terrorist attack from happening. Well, his boss at CTU went through quite a few people, but this guy was his boss the longest, playing Jack Bauer's superior at CTU for four seasons, from season four to seven, making him the longest standing CTU director. Please welcome Mr. Bill Buchanan himself. James Morrison. How are you, sir? Hi, Scott. Hey, Bob. Hello. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Appreciate Thank you. Your Good to be here. To talk. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that uh, documentary that I mentioned about that you and your wife have produced uh, showing up. And I think you have some other things you wanted to yeah. mention as well. Sure. Okay. 
And our final guest. This is a great thrill for me, I'm going to be honest. Our final guest is an actor and producer with more than 50 credits to his name. Some of his recent film credits include uh, Wishman, 94 Feet, and The Thundering Eighth. Now, like uh, James, he has appeared in more TV shows than I can count, and there's more credits that I could ever possibly mention. But I think there is one role that everybody is going to always remember this guy for. As one half of the motorcycle cop duo who patrolled the highways of California, rescuing people, locking up bad guys, and doing all of this without him and his partner ever drawing their guns, which is no easy feat. <laughs> and I think he might be making history today on my round table. I think this guy is the very first person at the risk of making him feel old. I think he is the very first person I've ever interviewed who I had an action figure of at one point. And I have a very funny story to tell him about that. Say hello to Officer John Baker himself, Larry Wilcox. How are you, sir? And we can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for having uh, me. And uh, no Good morning. Good thanks morning. for waiting. Oh, Good no morning. problem. We appreciate it. Now, uh, one thing that I mentioned in the intro is the fact that, you know, when I do these things, I find it interesting because, you know, as a networker, because, you know, I'm in the business of entertainment, I like to network and, and stuff. And uh, one thing I like to do is, you know, sometimes connect people who have never and none of you have ever met each other before. Is that right? Correct. Never. Correct. Now, now, I think some of, now I'm guessing some of you have heard of each other, like Bob sure. and James. I'm sure you it's kind of hard not to hear the word gyps and not know who Larry Wilcox is. Yeah, and that's that's a classic right. yeah. around for a very long time. That's right. Not sure, James and Larry, if either of you ever saw the commercial I was talking about that Bob was in. I have. You know, I did. You know, I think we probably did, but I, you know, I'm hard of hearing. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize joke. mentioning that was going to set up a lot of jokes here. Yeah, so many terrible jokes. I know. <laughs> oh, so, so, and your eyes are kind of messed up too, huh, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Now. One thing I wanted to uh, do just real quickly here is, like I said, you know, Bob, you're here to make sure I don't go down the fanboy rabbit trail. But one thing that could help me just before we get into the questions, there is one little thing I need to share with both James and Larry that I thought that they might get a uh, one is a 24 story. One is a chip story that I thought they both might get a laugh out of real quick. Uh, James, yeah. uh, this actually occurred when you had just been on the show for about uh, a year. It was the fifth season. And believe it or not, uh, during the time 24 was on, it was very popular among the people at my church, including my pastor, a gentleman named Ken Stanford. And uh, during the fifth season, I think it was the first year that they did uh, Let's Burn the First Four Hours in Two Nights, where they you know, showed the first mm -hmm. four hours of the season. And so the second night, uh, we actually all got together at a friend's house and uh, watched the uh, second half. And, my pa and it was the episode where uh, Kiefer is almost – is uh, captured and he's uh, giving information to you guys, but he says I'm in a flank two position, meaning that he's talking on duress. And uh, we were all kind of saying to each other, he's probably saying that, he's probably saying that. And then my pastor goes, but it's old protocol. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I bet you anything, it's old protocol. And he was the one person who called that coming. And we all thought that it was gonna be one of those things where you surprised the audience and they didn't know it was coming. But my pa my pastor, Ken Stanford, called that, a mile, called that a mile away. It was kind of an interesting, little moment there. I actually recorded us reacting to the uh, episode long before anybody did reaction videos, but I never did anything with it. I thought about like sending it to John Kassar or something. That's an interesting thing for a pastor to know, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you think that that's interesting, this is, yeah. this is something, uh, this does not have to do with the seasons that you were on, but I promised that if I ever met a cast member of 24, I would just tell them that this existed. Okay. okay. I was in one of my favorite Christian bookstores one time and I came across this. This is a 24 devotional book. Oh, wow. <laughs> Somebody wrote a unauthorized devotional book about the first season of the show. This gives you an idea as to how far the re how far of a phenomenon the show really was. Oh, no, I remember uh, I, I remember the viewing parties, too. Friends of mine would tell me about uh, how they gathered uh, the theater people because, they're, you know, Monday is dark. It was Mondays, wasn't it? Yes, I think so, yeah. And there was no, I mean, it was before streaming, so nobody, right. you know. We had to wait, uh, you know, another week. Yes. Um, they would they would say, yeah, that uh, dark from the theater, and we'd be watching, the, have these viewing viewing parties in in Connecticut. You know, all the theater people would get together, and I go, and just, just people that didn't seem likely to to be fans, but uh, right. yeah, it it touched a nerve. 
Well, I was surprised when I saw this, and I was like, how in the heck do you do a devotional book about 24? And basically, it's only the first season. This was from before you were on the show. Every chapter is the writer writing through a scene from the show, comparing it to a Bible story, and then comparing it to an everyday life situation where you might be having a bad day. Wow. I wondered if he was ever going to do anything for the subsequent seasons, but this was the only one that ever existed. Uh, my guess is because it was completely unauthorized, he would have gotten into trouble if he had done any more. That would probably just be my best oh, guess. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, those those corporate overlords can be pretty. <laughs> and that's true. That's true. Of course, all the cons that uh, I'm sure that you, John, you and Eric are constantly at, they've kind of made, because they make money now, the, the people who are controlling all the copyrights are a little bit more um, lenient now. Like my Mario show, I never could have gotten away with a couple of years ago, but now <laughs> they don't care. It's free publicity. As long as you're not selling anything, that's uh, mm -hmm. that you've made yourself. Okay, now, so I already, this is already a little bit longer than I thought. Now, John, uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing right there. <laughs> Larry, do you mind if I call you Larry? <laughs> Doesn't matter. You, whatever right, you want. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think you're in the okay. rabbit hole, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm already there. It didn't take too long at all. All right. All right. Let me see if I can get. I said in the intro that you were one person who I actually who I had an action figure of, and that's that's true. I started off with the um, uh, GI Joe size ones, and uh, within about six months, uh, I had accidentally broken off uh, Eric's arm, and you had fallen apart into like three pieces. Right. So my grandma, who lived right next to us, uh, she felt bad about this. So she actually got me the uh, the eight inch ones. She got me yeah. a bunch, an eight inch figure, and we didn't have. I, she didn't buy the motorcycles, so I was riding them around on these yellow motorcycles that were on another toy that I had. They actually fit. So fast forward to a couple months later, I'm at my mom's cousin's house, and uh, they tell me, "Oh, we have the Pontiac figures, and we have one of the motorcycles." And I'm like, "Oh, I got to see that." So I'm playing with the motorcycle and the Pontiac John figures with my cousins. And I'm looking at the dolls and I'm going, that's weird. And I say to my mother, uh, mom, why does their John figure look different than mine? And my mom and my grandma finally had to confess. She had gone to the store and they only had the Ponch dolls. So yeah. she had opened up the case, taken some bleach or something and made the Ponch dolls blonde. Hair blonde and told me. <laughs> that they were Ponch and John figures. And I believed it because I was a kid. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, the following Christmas, uh, they got me the actual uh, John figure as well as the one of uh, Robert Pine's character. And uh, <laughs> with, by the end of the day, uh, the leg of Robert Pine's character fell off and my dad had to go down to, I don't know if I was a rough kid or if they just bought them on a discount. Uh, he had to go down and uh, take a screw and put uh Robert Pine's leg back on and his leg was never the same after that. You could never stand him up because his leg was so loose. But anyway, so that's my, that's my chips action figure story right there. And at this well, point, who's, who is uh, Robert Pine played the, the uh, captain there? The, yeah. Sergeant yeah, 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 Gattrer. Yeah. 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 Funny story is I didn't even know what that character's name was until I saw the chips 99 reunion. We, did, when I was watching the show, we just called him Sarge. We didn't, yeah. we didn't call anything else but Sarge. Cause I yeah. think that's, you guys he, he, he makes a joke now where he says, uh, you know, I used to be known as Sergeant Gattrer or Sarge on chips, and now I'm known as Chris Pine's father. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what year was what what, what years were was that on? Uh, late seventies, early eighties. Okay. Seventy six to eighty three or so. And uh, I'll tell you a real quick story on those action figures they look like the neanderthal dolls by the way and weren't very complimentary but at least they were action figures right and i took my two little boys once to toys r us and they were looking through the toys and then all of a sudden they said dad dad come here i said yeah what, what's wrong you're an action figure right here in action <laughs> and it made it was like wow that's what it took to be my son's hero an action figure that's kind of weird right that's fantastic but it was cute yeah so uh yeah here's uh we have a bunch of those so-called action figures and <laughs> bobbleheads and all that junk you know that, that yeah. people collect yes Oh, one final thing about the story I forgot to tell you. So after I got the real John action figure, I had this paunch with bleached hair. Mm -hmm. well, by that time, the syndicated reruns were still going, but the sixth season, which you were not in, had right. come on. And I looked at this uh, bleached haired paunch and I'm like, 
uh, he kind of looks like Bobby Nelson. So he became my Bobby Nelson action figure, which never, which never actually existed. So. Oh, good. The transformation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, it was just one of those, it's one of those stories that you never know what kids or what parents will do for their kids. Okay. Yep. And with that, I'm taking off my fanboy hat and putting on my commentator host hat. And let's get into talking about the world of acting. Um, Bob, you probably have answered this question already because you were on my first show. Uh, but it's been a long time since we shot that, so feel free to repeat yourself. I was wondering if we could go around real quick and everybody could just uh, tell our viewers, when did you first decide that this is what you wanted to do? All right. Anybody and, could jump in. And you're starting with me? Or you can't? Anybody, anybody can start who wants to. Well, I can never remember when I didn't want to be an actor. Uh, my main problem was I didn't know how to get from the farm in the Ozarks uh, into the movie. So it took a lot of starts and stops uh, along the way, and uh, uh, including uh, 1970 being bachelor number two on the dating game. And um, uh, so, uh, <laughs> but ultimately, led to when I retired from the army, before I retired, I got an agent and started booking jobs. And so uh, finally, after many, many, many years and starts and stops, I can say that I've been a full-time actor for the last 30 years. All right, cool. Larry, James, either of you want to uh, tell your... Go ahead, James. Larry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, James. Um, well, I grew up in Wyoming in a little town as a cowboy and rodeo and all that stuff. And then I came, my uh, buddy and I moved to Beverly Hills. So I, I said, that's where I'm going, Beverly Hills, you know. And uh, so I moved to Beverly Hills and we were, you know, want to be Beverly Hills kids, if you will, broke and having a good time. But I met an old lady who said, hey, you look like boy next door. Do you want to take acting lessons? And so I studied with her for a couple of years and I got a real old agent that were famous back in the day named the Gene Halliburton Agencies. And this is in the late 60s, by the way. And uh, then uh, there was a death in my family. I went back to Wyoming and uh, got drafted. So I didn't want to be drafted in the army. So I joined the Marine Corps and I went to Vietnam. And when I came back from Vietnam out of the Marine Corps, uh, I, you know, always looked younger. So I started in, I got a new series, uh, Lassie. And uh, I started in Lassie and I was studying medicine at, at school, university. And, um, you know, I think I, I wanted two things. I wanted economic freedom and, uh, and I want, and my young child psyche ego was caressed by the acting crap. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time went on, I think there was a transformation where I studied with really, really good uh, people in uh, acting classes and so on. And then pretty soon you start thinking you're an actor in my case anyway. So I don't mean to generalize, but uh, so I got to play a lot of different characters in life and enjoyed the transformation. And so I don't think I really had a, a need to be an actor in the beginning, but it was, uh, it was a subtle transition from adolescence to adulthood, I guess. Mm. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Larry, I was interested in, uh, you mentioned the rodeo. Did you, did you actually compete in rodeos as well? Yeah. Yes, I did. I uh, was a member of the PRCA, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association, and I team rope and calf rope. Uh, when I was a boy, I rode bulls and bareback horses. And But, uh, you know, I was pretty good, but not great. And uh, I think, once again, I probably enjoyed the identity of the cowboy more than being a really good cowboy, you know. Mm -hmm. All my family were cowboys and rodeoed and had ranches and Hereford cattle and that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of had that background. That's why I always joke today is a lot of actors and especially stuntmen that I know that are, that are cowboys today, you know, they, they became cowboys in Hollywood mm -hmm. and then, then they became their own caricatures sometimes of what they think a cowboy is. And mine was the opposite. I was a cowboy and ended up in Hollywood. The real deal. Were you a cowboy? Um, I was no, I was a farm boy, but uh, yeah. not not really. We did raise cattle, but I was a poor excuse for a farm boy to tell you the truth. They'd say you go this way and drive the 
cattle this way, I could do that. But <laughs> I wasn't very imaginative. I was all caught up in the make-believe world of Hollywood that I wanted to be part of. And uh, so I was not, I was kind of a poor excuse for a cowboy. But, you know, rodeo though, Larry, is mm -hmm. extremely popular. Uh, and I don't think people realize it these days, but my brother, for example, that still lives every night, he doesn't watch anything but rodeo. Yeah. The whole channel that is, uh, you know, dedicated to it. Yeah. Professional bull riding and all that other stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, James, how about over to you? Um, well, first of all, uh, welcome home, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James. Glad you made it back. Um, yeah. Same here. Um, and uh, where where in Wyoming? Rollins, Wyoming. It's oh, Rollins. Uh, South okay. my, Central. Yeah. My, my, my family's from Wyoming. Oh, great! Oh, I, didn't, I didn't grow up there. I wasn't born there, but they, uh, my, both my parents were uh, Kemmer and Rock Springs. Oh yeah, Rock Springs is a tough town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting that I mean, I'll, I'll get to how I started, but uh, I wanted to be a, a bullfighter, you know, a rodeo clown when I was a kid, and uh, and thankfully, I, I, I. My better uh, instincts, you know, took over because it's a it's a hellish way to make a living. Um, it is. I, you can't have too long a career. I mean, they, they're just always getting hurt. <laughs> I can just imagine. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up in the circus instead as a clown, which was a, a, almost as bad. Huh. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, but I started uh, in high school actually, and uh, and uh, my mother knew you know how badly i wanted to do this but i was uh, i was so painfully shy that i couldn't uh even you know she just i don't know i couldn't come out of my shell you know and so one day she said you know they're they're uh, i know you were talking about doing this but so let's go to this audition and i'll i'll go with you and i'll audition too and i mean i'm, I'm i don't know what i am 17 years old so i said oh yeah okay so she didn't get a part because, you know, she had no desire to do it, but she wanted yeah. to get me there. She wanted to help get me there. And and, and uh, that's how it started. Um, community theater in Anchorage, Alaska, where I grew up. Mm. Awesome. And then uh, uh, after New York, I spent for a year and served an apprenticeship with a regional theater in Anchorage. Got my equity card, but I made it to L.A., and on the day that my mother passed, I got my first TV job. Oh. And I, I turned it down initially because I said, man, I can't, you know, I can't do this. My, my mom just died. You know? Yeah. And my sister said, no, 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 you have to, you have to do this. This is what you, this is what you do. You have to do this. She, she, you know, probably made it happen. You know? Yeah. Great and story. So, uh, so I did, uh, she, you know, she did her deal from heaven and, and got me a, it's my SAG card gig. Yeah. What so was I the did, show, Jane? I, I did that. Yeah. What was your first? What was the first role you did? It was a It was uh, Desi Arnaz Jr.'s uh, show called Auto Man. Oh, really? Yeah. I remember that actually. It was about a a, a computer cursor that came to life mm -hmm. as a as a big hulking superhero guy. I forget his name, but he was a giant of a guy, and I played a. Uh, uh, I played a stripper, male stripper, male. <laughs> Chippendales. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of a, that's where we met. I was headquartered, but I was a cat burglar by night. <laughs> In fact, that was my stripper name, Gary the Cat Burglar. <laughs> and I remember uh, the first, one of the first shots we did was I'm dancing in the club full of women, but at, back in those days, and, and uh, you'll remember this, the sound uh, they they couldn't have uh, live sound in a in a take because it was it, it would uh, it wouldn't match you know so, something to do with not matching or something. Couldn't so they it. had these women you know standing around like this pre pretending to clap their hands no, no sound no music and I had to dance in this room full of, in this club you know and I <laughs> but I remember after the first take and I just and I and of course there's no choreographer so I had to. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah. And I but I stopped in the middle of it and I went, oh my God, my my <laughs> my mother just passed. And I'm just yeah. I'm trying to pretend like I'm a 
man, that's 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 acting. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Robert, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you gonna say something? There? Go ahead. Oh, I was I was gonna say Desi Arnaz Jr.'s. I think I did his first movie, but maybe not. I uh, co-starred with him in a movie. Uh, called Mr. and Mrs. Bojo Jones. And uh, I remember he was a real handsome young kid and all the girls loved him. And uh, he and Dean Martin's son were uh, big stars, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the best day, the best thing about working on that show was actually that uh, his mom came to the set one day. Oh, wow. Oh. And uh, so I got to meet her and that was a, yeah, that was a treat. Yes. Bob, interestingly enough, uh, you uh, accidentally asked James what was going to be my next question for all of you, which was, um, what was your very first uh, acting role, whether it be television, stage, or anything? So, James, you kind of already answered that. So, uh, Bob, Larry, what were what was your very what were your very first roles? Um, in acting role, hmm. I I don't know how far I would have to go because initially I did an awful lot of extra work. So technically I'm just, you know, in the background and uh and and, and doing that and doing what I can to uh I actually don't even know which my first principal role was. Um I do remember working on a movie, a, Ke a Keanu Reeves movie called The Replacements. And uh I got called out to be a reporter um with uh the second unit and then all of a sudden the after we were doing it the second unit director told me to say something oh. so i happily did and so uh I, I got upgraded uh to a principal role and that was probably one of the first principal roles in a major production of course i'd done a lot of plays and uh, those kind of things you know before that time but probably the replacements when i got an upgrade that's the one where he's coaching the baseball team, right? Yeah, the, the you've got this. Uh, well, they go on strike and they recruit all of these, you know, different characters to fill out the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Larry, how about you? Uh, mine was an army commercial. <clears throat> I went on. You know, I really made a great living for a while doing commercials. I mean, I you know they used to say if you get one out of ten you're a home run hitter and I was always getting one out of ten. It says something about youth and the boy next door look at that time. So it wasn't anything about talent. It was I think a lot to do with look. But um, so I did an army commercial. Uh, then in those days you, there was this conflict. You you couldn't do the commercial unless you were a SAG member, and if you weren't, but you couldn't get your SAG card unless you had a job. And you know it was like. Finally, I got Taft Hartley, as they called it. They allowed you to do one job or two jobs, and then you get your union card. And then I did a Sears and Roebuck, uh, which used to be a in business uh, commercial for them. And then after that, I just started doing a lot of commercials, and uh, and then eventually Lassie. Okay, thank you very much. All right, mm -hmm. let's see what I have here next on my questionnaire. Okay, this might be a hard one, um, but I want. You guys do talk about uh, your favorites. Do you have a favorite uh, role you've ever played? Do you have a favorite scene from a project you've done? Anything like that? Hmm. Well, of course, I would be remiss if I did not say Lucifer and the Father. I mean, you know, playing <laughs> God is a fairly uh, uh, kind of a heady role to take on. <laughs> Where do you go from there, Bob? I mean, really. <laughs> yeah. It, it was also challenging because I had these long monologues to to deliver as well. But uh, yeah. you gave our director probably, the nickname Shakespeare. Yeah, that's right. I I call him Billy Billy Shakespeare. But um, of course, then the other one that was a very heady experience for me when I auditioned um, for the role of Doctor Joseph Barnes in Spielberg's Lincoln and um was uh was cast in the role it's only one scene but it's the uh, next to last scene in the film and um daniel day lewis is lying on the bed dying i'm directed by mr spielberg and i had to uh, you know go over and remove the covers back and listen to his uh dying breath with a wooden stethoscope and then deliver the lines announcing his death so that was quite a heady experience of 
you know, talk about a team that was that was kind of the top of the line. And um, I actually not sure I quite equaled that set. So that could have been the peak. But it was great memories. Sure. So, James, hey, James. Uh, you. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was, you know, I was thinking about uh, uh, working with uh, an actor like Daniel Day uh, Lewis, and and but but he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still but you're there you know you're um i did a a, a, a scene like that in uh with spielberg actually and uh catch me if you can and uh i'm the pilot in fact i like to say that i inspired the, the there would be no film without what i did in it because i inspired leo to become a, an airline pilot oh. when, when he saw when he saw me you know with the bevy of beautiful uh, flight attendants, mm -hmm. um, my my uh, my favorite, huh? If you have one, if you don't, I understand. Yeah, Sorry. no, I you know I of course I, I enjoyed doing uh, uh, the the Buchanan uh, part a lot because it was the you know when you do a long running thing and you know uh, and 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 Larry you probably un uh, relate to this too, but you you get you have time to sort of settle into it and you understand the the relationships and you understand the 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 needs of the of the uh of the project uh, you know as you get uh, warmed into it and and uh, it becomes like a second skin so that's always great so speaking of that though and speaking of actually uh, the all american boy in this case i guess gone to seed uh i did brick in cat on a hot tin roof three times in about a 10 year period um, and from the first product, it's, it's the, the, the most difficult part I've ever done. I think probably the most difficult ever written because it's, it's, uh, uh, he's in denial and you don't know you're in denial when you're in denial. So you can't really act it. So, and it's, it's incredibly difficult, but it's a beautiful, beautiful play. And, um, so from, uh, 1983 to 1992 at, uh, three different uh, theaters I, I did that role and finally by the third time I finally felt like I got it right so uh, that was I think that's my favorite all right well thank you yeah Mr. Wilcox yeah <clears throat> well you know I think always when, when you look like I did as a young man a young boy really um, I always didn't really want to look that way I always wanted to be a character actor so I I enjoyed doing all these little so I would do episodic stuff if they would allow me to be a weird character. So I don't have one but and forgive me to sounding like I'm not bragging by the way I'm just saying that I went and did these different roles and so sure. I'd do Murder She Wrote and I'd play this greasy kind of ugly character that you know was a smart ass and and then uh, they would say, could you do a love boat? And I said, only if I can be a nerdy guy with glasses and, you know, just an obnoxious, ugly kind of character. And so they'd say, okay, Larry, you, you know, we'll pay you top of the show if you come and do that. So I would do that. My, <clears throat> there would be my girlfriend would be Catherine Bach. And uh, <clears throat> then I did a movie with uh, the director, Andrew McLaughlin, who used to use me in almost there a lot of the stuff that he did and he was a great old guy six foot seven director and and um we did a western and i had fun being this guy always sucking on candy canes and dumb <laughs> as shit and excuse my language and and uh, in love with barbara hershey and james colburn and charlton heston were co-stars in it michael uh what was michael's last name michael Parks, Michael Parks was a great actor, by the way. Mm -hmm. I always thought he had some demons, but uh, he was a great actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I read for Miami Vice after Chips as a kind of greaseball, stubble, scarred, angry human being. And that's on my website at LarryWilcox.net. And I'm really, I was really proud of that reading. They cast me and said, you got the part and you're going to star in this series is playing the lead role. Now we need to find an actor to read with you. And so for, I don't know, three months, six months, a lengthy period of time, I read with all these actors and, and uh, 
then the, the head of NBC, uh, forgot his name right now, but uh, he was a fan. And so he had written in his book that he had picked Larry Wilcox to star in as this weird character. And and, my, and Don Johnson had read, but they, they let him go. They didn't want to use him. And uh, lo and behold, like uh, acting roles happened, you know, they gave me a call around Christmas and said, hey, we're, we're really sorry, but uh, we're going to change our mind and go a different way after all this, Larry, really sorry you've read with 30 actors, you know, and you're a great actor, but you will want to go a different way. So that was always one shoulda, coulda, woulda that I wanted to do, but didn't get, you know, but it would have been much different than Don Johnson, but uh, in respect to him, probably the, he was the right choice because he was a more, he played it more as a commercial success kind of guy with the Ferrari and the good looks and all that kind of stuff. And mine was a badass. <laughs> so yeah, but, anyway. But, wait a minute. Uh, I, have a, I have a question about that. They, they yeah. put you through the ringer and they, and you, you gave them a, a really valuable assistance and then they just cut you loose. Yeah. Yeah, they okay, did. Yeah. Uh, a lot of apathy, you know, in the film business. There's a lot of those yeah. stories, and yeah. I mean, I have a bunch I won't bore you with, but yeah, that, that, oh, to no, answer they, your they, question, they, I gave you a deck of cards. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. The, the worst thing, the worst thing, is when you when they do that, and the uh, and they string you along and string you along, and then you you then you watch the person that they ended up, you know, it became it comes down to to you and the guy that's going to get it basically. Yeah, and, and uh, but you see them doing it, and you go, "Wait a minute, that's something I did in my, in my audition." <laughs> they stole, yeah, they stole yeah. your, your, your bit, you know, and and and, and you go, you know, you could have had so much more if you'd just gone the yeah. right way. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, there's a when you, you know, as actors, sometimes we indulge ourselves and talk about the layers that we hopefully we bring to our signature. And all those layers and background and psychological research and subtleties and physical actions and overt actions with your verbiage and all, how you walk and talk and fart and burp and all those things, you know, <laughs> um, become interesting. And then you see somebody else do something and they sometimes you feel like uh, they didn't want any of that depth. They just wanted this, you know, so so be it onward and upward. That's right. You know, you were talking about some of your TV roles and stuff. One, one thing that I remember you in is uh, you played one of the uh, falsely accused, the accused defendants of Perry Mason in one of the TV movies, the case of the avenging ace. Yeah. And in my opinion, you were the most unlucky defendant ever because not only were you framed for one murder, but two. Yes. But yeah. You're serving, you've been serving 18 months for a crime. You didn't commit a witness comes forward and then you're framed for the murder of that witness as well. And yeah, I remember watching that thing going like, someone really has it out here for Officer Bates. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we actors, you know, we always talk sometimes about the role or acting or whatever, right? But but boy, do we get some neat benefits, and I'll try to be brief so I don't steal the microphone here. But um, during that, that filming, I, my wife was up there with me, and she, she was training. She's an Olympic track and field athlete in the heptathlon seven events. And I'm a pilot, and uh, and I love aviation. I'm an aviation groupie, a fanboy of aviation, of anything and everything aviation. So we while filming that show, they were I was in the hangar as this ace pilot, right? And all these A7 jets were in there and the pilots were in there and I got to talk to them. I said, hey, any chance I can go flying with you on the weekend or something when we're not filming? And so we went and flew. They said, well, have you ever been through ejection seat training, which I had, and they checked through DC to see if my records were really true. And so they said, wow, we we're surprised you've been through ejection seat training. I said, yeah. And so, um, you remember, you know, you're going to pull this one or this one when you eject. And yeah, I've been through all that. I can do that fine. But anyway, we went and did war games against F-16s. And I got to fly the plane. I have two wingmen next to me, right? Taking off. Talk about your ego, right? And wow. uh, and then we did war games against the cadets out of the Air Force Academy. And then our hydraulics went out on our plane after we won the war games in an inferior aircraft. But we had to do really high G-force poles and so on and to make a long story short uh we were going to eject so he says larry uh we have an emergency we have no hydraulics in our front nose wheel and i said well 
I'm a pilot. You can flop that gear down by a manual and then yaw your airplane and get them locked in place. And he said, well, it's good you know that, but it doesn't help the nose wheel because the nose wheel is just going to flip and flop and we're going to roll the airplane and crash and burn. And I'm an Air Force Top Gun pilot, he said, but I've never landed on an aircraft carrier and I've never used the hook. This plane happens to have a hook because it's a J model, meaning two seats. But he says, I've never done it, so we're going to try one time. And if I say eject, eject, you're going through the canopy, you look up at the canopy and all that gun smoke, all that glass is going to come down on you and then we'll go through it. You'll pass out and you'll wake up and the canopy's open and we'll parachute, okay? And if we can catch it, great. But if we can't, I'm going to eject you if you don't eject. So which one are you going to pull? I says, this one. So he says, okay. So uh, uh, we got all prepared my poor wife's out there and all the firemen his asbestos suits and everything and we caught the hook the first time man oh wow and part of me says oh man i so wanted to be i gotta <laughs> eject right it would have been cool to say that mm. i actually ejected and then other part of me was crying like a baby thinking you do not want to eject right mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was that that was an aside how lucky i was to go and do that versus the acting part of it, you know, there's all kinds of those little subsets of stories, if you will, that made yeah. acting fun. I'm That's sure. true. That's true. And, you know, one of the one of the other reasons I was going to say that I wanted to become an actor was, you know, I just decided at a certain point that why, why not, why, you know, worry so much about what I want to do in life when I can just pretend to be all these different things. Oh. No doubt. And it turned out to, to, to be a man, you know, if you're in this business long enough, 50 years now, I've played truck drivers, you know, yeah, yeah. To, from from cops to lawyers to doctors and, you know, patients. I mean, everything. Yeah. Actually, James, it's funny you bring that up because one thing that I was going to ask you guys about here was, okay, two real, two real quick. Bob, bear with me here. I have something to mention to James and Larry, okay? Uh, first of all, James, you know, I've mentioned this early, you know, saw you four years as um, Bill Buchanan on uh, 24. You were a guy who was always calling the shots during the last season that you were in. You went rogue because there was corruption in the government and you had to do the right thing. At one point, Kiefer Sutherland's character even says that the White House being attacked depends on you torturing a guy and you won't do it because you're not trained at those type of things. I mean, let's be honest here. I think Bill Buchanan was a really good guy who loved his country. Fast forward to a couple months later, I'm watching a show called Revenge. And there you are as a like 40, 40 year assassin. You were even suspected of killing the main uh, murder victim of the show. And it was just, it was just, it was interesting to see someone who I had associated so much with wrong role playing something completely the opposite. Now, another example of that would be uh, Mr. Wilcox. I think I've gone on enough about how much I like the show Chips and how much you are associated with chips and i think it's fair to say that between you and ponch you were the more level-headed of the two cops you were more by the book you were more more serious well my grandma same grandma who got me the action figures god rest her soul i really liked watching another show that i watched on again and off again called macgyver and in one episode called boys and guns that had to do with street gang violence there is this former crooked cop who has now turned to selling arms to teenagers and even shoots one of them in the back in his first scene. And yeah. it took me a while to say, is that Larry Wilcox? Is that, <laughs> that it? you? <laughs> I mean, I'd only seen a few episodes of MacGyver and here I am rooting for him to kick the tar out of you in the last scene. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that was, so I guess my, I, I guess my question is, you know, clearly because of that, neither one of you have had to worry about much typecasting or maybe you have, maybe you had to fight for that role. I don't know, based on what you said earlier. But I guess it was just after spending, you know, like four years as John Baker or four years as Bill Buchanan, when you get a script like that or get a role like that, are you like, oh, I'm the bad guy? Are you like, I'm the bad guy? I mean, what, what's the what's the reaction to something like that when you've been cast as something that's completely the opposite of what you had spent so much time playing? Is it a is it a challenge you look forward to or? Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I I I approach uh, I was trained to think of acting as a, a game of make believe anyway, so it's 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 like what we do when we're kids we you know somebody says uh okay you're going to be the 
bank robber and I'm going to be the cop and you go, oh, okay, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't question it. We just, we accept it and submit and, and we don't think about it. We don't make, I don't know. There's no acting choices when your kid playing in the sandbox. There's just fun. You just have to yeah. have fun. You know, you just want to sub, you know, you just want to make believe, play pretend. So that's that's uh, that's how I look at it. But I, there are certain things that I won't do. There are certain things that are if they're too bad, I, you know, I won't I won't hurt kids or I won't be uh, a, a you know a racist uh, a KKK guy. Any anyway. you know, I've done that, and it's, I don't like the feel. You know, we have to live in those things. Right. And so if there's a there's a there's a line that, that you draw, I, I, I do anyway. Um, but it's 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 just pretend. man. Yeah, I know what you mean. One thing that um, I get asked a lot of about the short film that Bob and I did is people have asked me, Scott, why did you you were the producer and the writer? Why did you play Satan yourself? And there were several reasons. Part of it is a, I'm just a ham. But another reason is because, as you said, you have to get into the mind of your character. Let's be honest here. Satan is not a very good mind to to get inside of. And I I was afraid that maybe another actor wouldn't understand that I wanted this guy as evil as possible. I want so I'm like, you know what? I'm an actor. I know how evil I want him to be portrayed as, so I will do it myself. Because and it, it wasn't mine that I was like, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole. I know I use the expression rabbit hole a lot, but I didn't want to get too far down that rabbit hole either. Uh, Larry, so did you have fun playing that role on MacGyver that was could have been could not have been anything further than from John Baker. <laughs> yeah, I always, you know, sometimes you'll get a script. Uh, first of all, you know, as James was talking, I, I always call it the Walter Mitty in all of us that I got to do all those things and different roles. And it was fun. You know, I, I got to play all those characters, some of whom I thought I knew well, and some of whom I were introduced to as an actor. Right. But I think the important thing is, is it's fun because I don't, in my case, I apologize. You know, I think 24 was a great television series or very good, but often you don't get good scripts. And so when you're handed a role, it's written as sometimes as in my case, it'd be a Johnny all American. And so the frustrating part is, gosh, how do I make this character interesting and differentiate and complete the writer's intent and add some substance to him because he's really a boring character. Yeah. And so, yeah, the answer to your question, I was uh, happy to play that role and added things in there that weren't in the script and uh, it was fun and I was grateful and humbled. And he was a great guy, uh, MacGyver, the actor. Uh, yeah. For, yeah. He was a really nice guy. He played the, It looked like he played the character like he was high the whole time or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like you, <laughs> I don't you know. Almost, you were almost too. You were almost too. Too like, oh yeah, these punk kids. They get almost like you were saying it all too much. On John. I rewatched the Avenging Ace and that episode of MacGyver and some uh, Twenty Four scenes prior to this to kind of refresh my memory on both your guys' work. Yeah, thank you. But anyway, uh, yeah, speaking James, of work, I, uh, one of the things you mentioned, acting is pretend, but I think it's a very fine line, and I've always kind of subscribed to don't let them catch you acting. Yeah, oh, you sure. have to yeah. be. You know, you, it has to be. It has to come within. And I sure. think if you can figure that out, then any role that you're coming from, you you can really make it work for you. And and, yeah, and yeah. you can tell an actor when it's fake. You know, absolutely. You know, you know. I mean, if you know, if you if you believe it, the people watching you will believe it. That's the way I look at it. Exactly. The more, you, the more we believe it, the more we believe that we're the bad guy, and we haven't made a judgment on that you know on that we're just doing what we need to do it's, it's cool that you were talking larry about you know the, you know the collaboration when we find a true collaboration when we get a script and we can and people are open on the other side to 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 what we bring to it completely and yeah. we feel free to be able to just uh create and and and, and really you know there's no um now be careful when you know. Don't go. There's no limits, you know. Basically, yes. they, they are accepting of of our of our contribution fully, and I mean that's when you can really be free. And and uh, so that's uh, you know because our 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 imaginations are unlimited. Yes. And, and if there... they allow us to to play, get it, get in there and play and and dig around, and uh, I mean there's no telling what we can do if we're free, you know. Yeah. To play. Yeah, it opens up the door, James. It's a really wonderful when you, 
you know, sometimes you'll meet other actors and, you know, they're not very receptive and they're competitive and oh, they, sure. it's not a good environment. And same thing with directors. And, and then you have the bully that thinks he's going to bully you, a director or whatever, right? And so you have all these different personalities, but when it's like collaborative, as you've indicated, it's a, it's a really a great feeling. Andy McLaughlin was such a great director. I mean, I was, I became almost manic and obnoxious in my input. I, I would, <laughs> at night I'd be rewriting the script of say, this is how this scene should go, Andy. And I'd put the sides underneath his door in his hotel and he'd wake up at five in the morning, Larry, Larry, you gotta shut up. You're, this is too much, you know, oh, but, man. but I probably gave him war and peace in terms of all the things that I thought could be added to the character in the story. But if he picked two things like in dirty dozen, I have myself always collecting these medals from Germans that we killed in the war. Right. And, and he, and this dumb guy that I'm playing is real proud of his medals and singing about him. And so that wasn't in the script. He let me write that in there. So, so that collaborative effort makes it really a lot of fun. It is possible for creativity to get out of control, too. No doubt. Yeah, and I mean, I, my my Amazon account is proof of that. Unfortunately, there'll be I've got junk sitting around my apartment here that I bought. I was like, oh, wouldn't this be great? For, and then I never used it. I was but like, you know, but you know what, Scott is? I think getting out of control. That's that's you don't want that on your conscience. You want to go out of control and have the director bring it back or other actors right. and sure. say that didn't work. Well. But if you have that oppression or that little bit of compression in terms of your creativity, and then yeah. you don't do it. And you know, then I was going to say, Bob, uh, to to what you said. I mean, you're just talking about bad acting, man. That, <laughs> that's all. That, I yeah. mean, seriously, we we we've all seen it. We, in fact, we've we've all done it. And so we have to be able to go, you know what, that's going to, I'm going to, I need to dial it in or I need to fine tune it or, or that sucked. Or, but we, but we learn and we move on and we grow. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say though, was, you know, I, I read an interview with, uh, and he's not, he's, you know, he's a, he was a wonderful actor, but, but I, he really nailed it in this. Uh, William Hurt was talking about what he did to get the role of his first movie was uh, Altered States. And he learned the whole script and he went in and I think it was, uh, who was it that directed that? Uh, Ken Russell, I believe. And he showed him how he would do the part and he, and he had so much time to work on this thing. And, but it, then he, then he said, you know, and, and, and when, but, but with TV stuff, you know, the, most of the, most of the time, these people just get the thing, they get it two days before they shoot it. Maybe one, if they're lucky, you know, uh, so if we're lucky, we've had it for a week, maybe two, but mostly it's really fast. Mm -hmm. And so you go in there and, 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 and nobody wants you there in the first place. Usually they just treat you like the dinner guest that, that they <laughs> invited you. You know, sometimes you'll get the person who knows how, what it feels like to be the guest, but, and, and they treat you all right. And, and, and we luck into a situation where it's, it's creatively, you know, welcoming. Mm -hmm. but, but for the most part, it's fast. You get one take, two takes, you're in and out. Uh, you barely, you know, know where you move. I mean, it's, and so you're. What he said was, you know, you're you're operating on basically fear, yeah. and and it's working so fast with these things, these guest star things, and man, I don't know how. Looking back on the stuff that I've done on TV, and it's it's a lot of stuff. How did I get through that? Hmm. I mean, you just you. Hey, you, Corey, you had some intense scenes on Twenty Four. Sorry. Yeah. You had some very intense scenes on 24. Well, and even that stuff, you know, it's real fast. I mean, they shoot two episodes at a time. They, yeah. they shot two episodes simultaneously. So you'd go from episode 14, scene seven to episode 13, scene two, right. back to back in the same, you know, walking from one set to the other. And it was a it was a challenge to be able to keep the, you know, these the the timeline straight. and oh, yeah. You know. Especially on a real time show like that. My, one of my favorite scenes with you, by the way, is the scene where uh, you and Sean Astin are arguing in the holding room just before you realize that his key card has gotten out there and you guys are about to be attacked by nerve gas. Yeah. That's one of my. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Sean was a, a, a really a good, a good person to work with. He's a good sport because I was uh, I was doing that with him. I was I was rewriting. <laughs> once they once they realized that I was OK doing that because I had so much exposition. Uh, I just said, you know, uh, I think it would be, it, it, it would, and I would take the script supervisor aside and say, 
I think uh, I can sound more like a human being if I say it this way. Yeah. And she say, listen, as long as you say Centox Gas and Jack Bauer and where Jack is in this <laughs> sequence, you can say it however you want. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just write it down. So it, they got to where they would they were pretty accepting of that. But yeah, it was some of that stuff was. As I watched 24, there's a lot of things that I had to uh, that I lot of that I said to myself. There's got to be people in the cast who are who are sick of asking the same questions. I mean, like how many times do people say "Where's Jack"? How many yeah. times do people yell "Chloe, do it" on the phone? How many times do they? How many times? Uh, Kiefer Sutherland probably got sick of asking where anything is, where everything is. Tell me where the bomb is. Where's the vials? Where's the, you know all that? Where's stuff. Bill? Yeah, huh? yeah, no, it's true. Right. I'm not sure how much time that we have left, but. I would like to make sure we find out. I think, James, you have uh, a yes. new project coming up soon. Oh, yes. That was actually, the, believe it or not, we got up to the uh, la the last question here. Yes. So I was going to, I was actually going to give this opportunity to have anybody uh, tell anything that they wanted to about any projects they have coming up. Oh, go so, ahead, Larry. I'd love to hear what you're doing. I want to hear more about your business, actually. <laughs> yeah, mostly um, I've been in technology mostly lately, uh, you know, we started with compression algorithms for full motion video back in the day. And we were doing uh, lots of compression. And then I went on and produced a bunch of stuff, uh, did a production with Canada, uh, which turned out kind of ugly because the Canadians misrepresented some stuff and I'm still having some problems with that. I produced a television series called the Ray Bradbury theater for HBO for five years and award-winning mm -hmm. television series with Peter O'Toole and Jeff Goldblum and Drew Barrymore and a bunch of other great actors. And uh, we did it in New Zealand and, and in Canada and London, UK, France, United States directed and produced it. And, um, and I did The Death of a Playmate, the Dorothy Stratton story, and then I bought the rights to the Waco Colt and, you know, did a bunch of productions. And, and then finally, I don't know, I just got uh, this bad taste in my mouth and decided to get out of the entertainment business. And and I went into technology. So now I have a company called uvcscience.net. And UVC is an ultraviolet ray uh, that we are the only company in the world that can magnify it by 1,500%. And as a result of that uh, magnification, if you will, isn't really magnification, but I'll use that as a reference point. Uh, we're able to kill all bacteria and COVID and viruses and cancer cells and so on uh, in seconds. So that device we have where we put in HVAC systems, heating and air conditioning, and we kill all the viruses ingress and egress into the building uh, through that system. And uh, it's, it's a new company. So we're, we've now have pre-orders for many millions of dollars for that product with distributors. And uh, so that's that. And then in the, I've been working on this funding which is kind of a false carrot, but I'll share it with you. That is a huge amount of funding. And uh, if it, it, it looks like keyword, um, like it'll be done here in the next week or so. And if that's consummated, then well, we're, we're going to do some really neat things in both technology, uh, satellite technology and uh, what are called meals or medium earth orbits. And, uh, and, um, the security in terms of all the debris that's out there in satellite heaven, if you will, is crazy. Mm -hmm. In fact, launches of themselves are having hard times because of all the debris. But uh, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. You know, I'm married, have five children. My children are all grown and educated and doing well. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful. And uh, God's been good to me. I'm, I'm grateful and humbled. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now, James, uh, some people who are watching might be wondering what all the papers hanging on your wall are for. Oh, and I believe the yeah. po I believe the poster for the movie I mentioned showing up is back there as well. These were, yeah. Uh, these these are. Uh, I, let's start at the beginning. When my son was ten years old, he's twenty five now, uh, working on his master's degree at Pepperdine. Um, Seamus. When he was ten years old, he he uh, had a brain tumor, a malignant brain tumor, and. Uh, 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 
spent uh, got radiation six weeks, two years of chemo, and went through all that. He had to learn how to walk and talk and use his right hand again, and and uh, so uh, I um, I ended up, I guess, in in a way to to process that. Uh, um, and because we were looking for something like this when we were going through it and there was nothing like it to be found, I wrote a play about it, a solo play about uh, what I learned from the experience from my son. And uh, it was developed at the Old High Playwrights Conference in 2019, right before we all locked down and it was starting to get some momentum and then everything shut down. So we produced it uh, in uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, at the Great Barrington Public Theater in in uh, twenty two, and I'm going to take it to uh, Whidbey Island up in the Puget Sound. Uh, they have a beautiful uh, performing arts center up there. In June, let's see, when am I going? June, yeah. So I'm learning. Uh, I'm I'm learning and rewriting as I go. But these things are um, the chapter titles that I have around my office. There are nine of them. It's a, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the memory technique, uh, the memory castle or the, uh, where you, you put uh, s sections of what you have to memorize in different rooms of a, of a castle, mm. a, a mansion. Mm. And then you, when you visualize that room, you remember um, what you have to remember. Mm -hmm. memory technique so i put these here so when i think of uh the second chapter called uh 300 steps i i i think of my bookshelf in the office and i think of where it is in that space that helps me remember it as i'm learning it so i'm going through that process awesome yeah you want to tell anybody about the uh, documentary showing up that you and your uh oh, yeah uh yeah we were talking about auditions uh showing up is a, f a film that my wife and i made in a documentary in Oh, 10 years ago, I think, we we finished up uh, editing it when we first moved to Ojai, where I live now. And uh, it's we talked to about uh, 60 of our uh, best actors, uh, some who have passed, some of the veterans from the 50s, uh, Eli Wallach and Pat Hingle, notably, um, about the how they feel about the audition and what they went through during their time and in, when they were auditioning and how they processed that you know it's basically about what uh and and people who've seen it uh that aren't actors you know say to us you know i do that uh i, I audition everybody auditions for everything you know we when we meet someone i mean this is mm -hmm. this meeting here is something of an audition i mean we're getting to know each other and here's oh. me and then here's how I would do, here's how I would do this if we do it again, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, we got, it was a conversation. It's a conversation, basically, about the audition process. Well, I do like the title showing up because one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, when I started, I've tried to do other roundtables that have not come to fruition, some reunions that have not come to fruition. I'm not going to mention any names or whatever. But the one thing that I do like is when I don't like being ignored. And so I appreciate you guys showing up today because people what people uh, have said to me, how do you get the people who are on your roundtables? And I'm simple. They're the people who call me back. You know what <laughs> I mean? Because there are some people, anybody who anybody I appreciate. I understand why actors have to have agents. OK, but there are some people I've tried to get that have so many layers of oh, gatekeepers buddy. between me and them that I know for a fact that they never even heard of me, that the gatekeeper cut me off and just uh, assumed that I wasn't something the actor would want to do without even, act, say, talking to said actor. You know, so that's, that's interesting you bring that up. Excuse me for interrupting you, but, okay. but because when we were doing Showing Up, we would uh, we went to New York and we, we had a casting director. He called the people at home and just yeah. said, uh, James and Riyadh, uh, my wife, are, are in town. This is James. This is his work. This is what they're doing. You need to show up at two o'clock to talk to them about the audition. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. I'll be there. Right. It wasn't a big deal. We were in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Call, you have to call the agent. Uh, well, well, yeah. But how much are you going to pay him? Well, you know, it's a documentary. Uh, well, yeah. I don't know. They, they, they don't audition anymore. Right. And you got, you know, it's, 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 yeah, there are layers and, but, but basically it's the person, it comes down to the person, I think. Right. Right. You got, yeah. you know, me, Bob and Larry here. I mean, we're, our, we're top of the line. So <laughs> you, are. Yeah. you guys, 
You guys you all have. Plays right there. <laughs> I wish I had as much. I mentioned how many IMDb credits you all have. I have four, and two of them are movies I wrote myself. So that shows you right there how I've gotten the acting jobs that I have. You guys have actually been through the ringer and the process and stuff like that. And yeah, I, but look at look at Larry. Look what Larry was just talking about. And, and, yeah. and look, I mean, what I what I just I wrote a play. Exactly. Larry started his own business. You know, you have to you have to make you have to create your opportunities. So yeah, absolutely. Sure. So I got a good magic act. I got a good group of people called the Mario Players. We all dress up as Mario characters and do programs. In fact, in fact, Larry, the one time I met you in person, I was dressed as Mario. You and um, yeah, you and yeah. uh, Eric were at, uh, I have a picture of it. I think I sent it to you. You and Eric yeah. were at uh, the Rhode Island Comic Con and uh, I came up to him and was like, hello, it's me. And I'm like, you don't recognize your Facebook friend, but you probably have so many that you <laughs> what, are you, you know, what are you doing, Bob? Yes, what yes, uh, yes, thank you. All right. What are you um, working on? Well, we, um, uh, I, I currently have a film called The Mardi Gras Man that has uh, been fairly recently released. That's on most streaming services. And um, then um, we are, uh, it looks like I'm in pre-production on a project called A Still Small Voice. And um, I think it's end up going to be a feature. We're actually doing a teaser in Texas coming up at the end of July. And I would play the prophet Eli. And okay. it's Hannah, okay. Hannah and Samuel story where she wants to have a child and dedicates him basically to the to the temple. It's that that part of. And the, this is part uh, of the faith based thing that uh, that you work on, huh, Scott. Uh yeah, yeah. I actually um, one of one thing that I tell people is that uh, I try. I say one bragging right is that I the very first uh, screenplay I ever wrote was uh, is one of the most panned Christian films on YouTube. There were at least seven people who we've been called the Christian Saw, believe it or not. We've been called a Christian movie that ripped off Saw, which we didn't. But there are similar. I haven't. Any, I didn't even seen the movie when we did it. But we do have one thing that is our claim. We ended up being Roddy Roddy Piper's last movie. Roddy Roddy Piper the wrestler was in our film. Sure, yeah. He had yeah. he had about as big a part as you had in Ninety Four Feet, Larry. Uh, so he was only <laughs> yeah. like a, he, oh, he was only like a scene a scene or two. But we were for better or for worse his last film. And we ended up uh, contacting some of these um, critic critics on YouTube. And I was like, you know, I could be defensive or I could say to them, would you like to talk about why some of these things are this way in this film? And five of them took me and Sean Justice, the director, up on our offer. And we ended up being interviewed by people who had criticized and panned our movie. And I'll, I'm happy to say a lot of them actually walked back their criticism once they knew uh, what we were facing and that we weren't a studio project and that we had a very limited budget and we had to do the best we could with what we had. So, Do you know that um, Larry and I share a film that we both have credit in? And that huh. film is Chip Rossetti's 94 Feet. Oh, my really? Only, my only contribution, I got special thanks because I made a small contribution to produce <laughs> the film and you had the lead, but... <laughs> We're both on IMDb for 94 feet. Oh wow! Yeah, the, you know that was a that's a good example of a learning curve because you know I know he had good intent but no budget and uh, sometimes you do things and then from a marketing and branding standpoint it, it isn't really a good choice right uh, because you're framing yourself in a tough situation. So I ended up shooting it for him in my office i shot all those scenes and once in my dining room and here i am setting up my camera setting up the lights then talking to you know a, 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 a supposed character yeah it was it was an interesting thing so you know i'm ha I always happy where people made their little films but talk about the tough way to go as you well know it's it's very all of you it's hard to get a film done produced and so as a result of that i always say be careful when you criticize people because when when you go in that war you're going to find out how hard it is to raise capital and get us something right. produced. exactly i uh, potentially have been uh, am cast in 10 projects and all of them are looking for money <laughs> yeah yeah you know, so some will never happen others might happen this year or it might be the next year so that's what that's what makes this business, uh, I guess, interesting is a way to, uh, yeah, uh, to label it. One thing in regards to the fact that you guys showed up here and you, like you said, James, you guys are the real deal. Thank you for 
respond. There was one other, I'm not going to mention him by name, but there was one other actor who I tried to get on this um, thing and it ended up being that he either had a schedule conflict or something and he, he couldn't make it. Well, that's fine. I mean, rejection is part of this business. Let's be honest here. What gets me is the people who don't even have the, who aren't even polite enough to say no. You know what I mean? If I'm like calling you trying to get an answer, if someone says to me, you can't you take a hint? I go, no, I can't take a hint. I want a definitive answer, even if it's one I'm, even if it's not the one I'm looking for. You know what I mean? I don't like well, being. Well, that, that's an actor's life, man. Never hearing no, but you know. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, anyway, with that said, does anybody else have anything that they uh, want to add before we wrap things up here? I think this is a good place. I'd like to say that how nice it was to meet you all, and I appreciate you uh, inviting me and and uh, Larry and Bob. It was a pleasure uh, sharing this this stage with you here. Oh, it's certainly my pleasure. Thank and you, Scott. So I appreciate you asking me, man. Oh, sure. No, but well, thank you. Thank you for saying yes, Scott, for making it happen. And uh, uh, yeah. excuse I like being me, Scott. Belt. Yep. Thank you also for having me and uh, James and Bob. Thank you for your time and insights. And uh, James, uh, God bless your son. Thank you very much. Yeah, he's you doing bet. really well. Thank you. You bet. Well, thank you all. This has been the Great Scots Roundtable. We'll uh, we'll see you next time. If I can find the right button here to turn off the recording. <laughs> uh.